Welcome to Chapel Hill. This is the second Sunday in Advent. We begin our service with the lighting of the Advent candles. We light this candle as a symbol of peace. May the shalom of God fill our hearts until we overflow with generosity. Come, O come, Emmanuel. As a child of the light, I went to follow Jesus. God set the stars to give light to the world. The star of my life is Jesus. In Him there is no darkness at all. Thank you for joining us today for worship. We're so thankful that you are participating on this second Sunday in the season of Advent. We've been singing this song, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light, because it's a beautiful song, but the words speak to us, especially in our day. And so we're going to sing it throughout Advent and on Christmas Eve. We hope and pray that you will join us. I also want to give a shout out to the Chesser family. We're so thankful for their willingness to participate in the lighting of the Advent candles today. I also want to remind you that the service of Loss and Hope, scheduled originally for this coming Wednesday, has been postponed until a later date, and we'll keep you posted on that. Today is Chapel Hill 101. Those interested in our mission or membership, we meet today at 3 p.m. And just go to our website, chwichita.org, and if you scroll down to events, there's a link for you there. Now, I want to invite you to join me in our Advent prayer of the day. Would you pray it with me aloud? Let's pray together. O oh God, whose will is justice for the poor and peace for the afflicted, let the herald's urgent voice pierce our hardened hearts and announce the dawn of your kingdom. Let our complacency give way to conversion, oppression to justice, and conflict to acceptance of one another in Christ. We ask this through the one whose coming is certain, whose day draws near, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Peter, to the young church and to us. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, 
What sort of person ought you be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire? But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and new earth, where righteousness is here at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. The gospel is according to the evangelist Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with the camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to to God. God. This past week, I was in a local sandwich shop waiting for my order to be made when this man, frustrated because of the lack of service, started to yell and scream. The place was very busy. The staff were working really hard 
Nobody was slacking. They were all doing their part. But this man got really, really angry. And he just continued to escalate. And as I was watching him, thinking through, what am I going to do if he does this or that? I was reminded of what I've shared with you before. If I have a tube of toothpaste, assuming it's open, and I squeeze it, what comes out? What comes out, most people assume, is toothpaste. Not necessarily. What comes out is what's inside. That man was already frustrated, was already angry, was already dealing with a lot of inner emotion. And this became the opportunity where he found himself squeezed. And therefore what came out is what's inside. I find that there's a lot of people today who are finding that life is squeezing them. And there's a lot of things coming out. That's why Mark's gospel today is so important. It's so relevant. I've already had people say, oh, all this John the Baptist stuff and all this seemingly weird language, does it have anything to do with our lives today? Oh, yes. Because Mark's gospel begins in the desert, the wilderness. It's a place where it's dry, it's scorched, there's very little life, if any. And this last week, I was trying to keep track of what people were saying to me about their lives and what they're doing when they feel squeezed. I had one man say, I feel so dead inside. I had a woman at the Y say, I feel so thirsty and so hungry spiritually. I had another person say, I feel so distant from God. I had another one say, I feel so disconnected from others. I had another one say, I feel so full of pain because of my loneliness. I had another who said, times like these are so tough, I've never experienced this in my entire life. You know what I'm talking about. Right now for many people, life is like living in the wilderness in a place of desert. On a more humorous note, a person said to me, Jeff, it was a sad and disappointing day when I discovered my universal remote control did not, in fact, control the universe, not even remotely. We have to laugh or cry sometimes, right? When we look at all that's going on around us and especially within us. So if you look at the text of Scripture for the day, the Gospel lesson in particular, Pastor Jen did a beautiful job of showing us the context out of which these texts have come. The Romans were ruling, the Romans were dominating, the Romans were oppressing, their emperors demanding that people bow down and worship them. In fact, their emperors were called sons of God. And the temple, the very center of those who were following the living God, was destroyed. We don't know whether Mark's gospel was written before or after. I'm one of those who believes that it was destroyed in the middle of this gospel being written because John is speaking to people who are in the wilderness. They're leaving the town. They have nowhere to go. Their center place, the centerpiece of their life has been destroyed. The people of God were feeling then what we are feeling now. Many of us feel like we're in the desert, we're in the wilderness, and we're looking for answers. We're looking for hope. We're looking for a place of refuge. And these people then, and all of us now, are looking for connection or reconnection with the living God and each other. We're longing for the end of loneliness. We're hoping and praying for peace and security in our communities and in our families. The context was very different then. It was a different time and place. But the human experience, what's going on emotionally and spiritually, is very much the same. 
The wilderness looks very similar, whether it's the first century or the 21st century. So if you look at our gospel lesson for the day that Tyler and Aramie read for us so beautifully, verses one through five, you've got all this strange language. You've got a pithy, it's very short, but it's very powerful, where there's these words about the, the Baptist. Now, people will say to me, I didn't know that John the Baptist was the founder of the Baptist church. No, he didn't do that. He was a baptizer. And he was a forerunner to Jesus. And you will notice in this text that there's all kinds of interesting language and he's dressed very weirdly. It's all very strange to people. But today, in order to make this text come alive, will you allow me to put it in plain English? In all the language that you heard from the porters, hear this. What do you do when you find yourself in the wilderness? What do you do when you find yourself in the desert? What do you do when life seems to be falling apart? John the Baptist, in his own unique way as recorded by the evangelist Mark, is saying this. Hear this. This is really important. Work on yourself first. Go inward. Go deep down inside your soul. And let me be very clear. This is not self-help. One of the greatest lies in the kingdom of God is that God helps those who help themselves. As the scripture says, apart from Christ, we can do nothing. But as Dallas Willard says, if we choose to do nothing, it most assuredly will be apart from Christ. We participate with Christ. We participate with what God is doing in us and among us and through us. And God is not against effort. God is opposed to earning or entitlement. Effort is action. Earning is attitude. And in this text of Scripture, with all this strange language, what John the Baptist is trying to say is that when you find yourself in the wilderness, go deep, go within, and realize that you're participating with the living God in being able to cope, in being able to grow, in being able to become all that God would desire in spite of the wilderness or the desert. So verses 7 and 8, I do want to read for you. If you have a Bible, you can follow with me or on the screen. John the Baptist proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now that is language that John is using to say that we are participating with the living God in being able to not only survive, but to thrive in the wilderness in spite of all that is happening around us and within us. So I want you to hear this. This is really important. If you have been water baptized, you have been baptized by water and the Holy Spirit. We had two baptisms last weekend. I use that language. We say the Holy Spirit is the agent of God that makes the work of God present and available in the midst of a sacrament. So whether it is baptism or Holy Communion, we always ask the Holy Spirit to come down and do what only God can do. And the water or the bread or the wine simply points to what God the Holy Spirit is doing invisibly. Now hear this. What John is naming is really important. You and I participate with what the Holy Spirit is doing within us. There are certain things in this life that only the Holy Spirit can heal. There are certain things in this life that only the Holy Spirit can help us with that does not in any way discount anyone or anything else. It simply says that we received the Holy Spirit when we were baptized by water. But what John is saying is that you will receive a power greater than yourself that will empower you to do what you don't think you can do, which will help you be and become all that God would desire. So with water baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit. But when we decide to partner with God for growth, guess what? We don't get more of the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit gets more of us. Did you hear it? That's why one of my heroines of the faith, Corey Tenboom, she was a Holocaust survivor, was in one of the concentration camps because she hid Jews as a Christian. She was hiding Jews to protect them. And the Nazis captured her and she survived. Her sister did not. She says, and I quote, you talk about somebody who knows the wilderness. She's been in the desert. She understands what it's like to live in the wilderness of life. She says, I've discovered that you've got to put yourself, your ability, your pain, your wilderness, your desert, your whatever is bothering you, your money, your all. Put it all at God's disposal. God can do more with it than you can. That's what John the Baptist is saying. You say, well, Jeff, why? Well, I sure didn't get that. Trust me, that's what he's saying. And that's why the text from Second Peter Therefore, beloved, strive to be found by Christ at peace. How do you get that? How do you get there? How can you and I live in peace in spite of what's going on around us or within us? Now, I want to give you a tool, a spiritual practice. When John the Baptist talks about baptism of repentance, there's a lot there. Let me simply say this. The Greek word metanoia, which is properly pronounced Matanya is not, I'm going to beat myself up and feel really, really bad. No. That is not repentance. <laughs> is it commonly taught as repentance? Yes. I've had people for years tell me, Jeff, I know I've really repented when I, I just, I feel like I'm the scum of the earth. That's not repentance. That's insulting the God who made you. Repentance is when you change your mind. You look at life differently. You begin to examine life more deeply so I want to give you this tool and for the rest of this sermon all credit goes to St. Ignatius of Loyola he's one who created this tool or spiritual practice and I'm going to put this on the website you can go to chwichita.org if you want the tool it'll be in a form where you can easily copy it St. Ignatius said this that we need to practice at least once a day preferably twice if you're like me, I'm doing good to get it done once. He called this prayer the daily examine. And this is what it is. There's some R's. If you're a note taker, you can write these down. Or you can go to the website. You begin with relish and rest. In a very quiet space. I, I set a timer personally. And for 10 minutes, I just rest in God's presence, in God's love, in God's grace. And I just bask in God's glory and give thanks that I am God's child. That's where you begin. Then you go to review. What's the review about? You review the day. When did you feel close to Christ? When did you feel distant from Christ? When did you find your heart warmed? When did you find your heart bitter and hard? When did you find your mind thinking thoughts that are of God? And when did you find yourself thinking thoughts that were far from God? And you do a review. Now because you've already started in a place of grace, it's not about beating yourself up. It's about naming. Which leads to repent. Repentance is naming. It's just naming without blaming or shaming. So if you think that repentance is rooted in shaming or blaming, why would you want to do that? It won't help you grow. It will stunt one's spiritual growth. So repentance is naming. And I begin to name the ways in which I've hurt people. I've hurt myself. I've hurt the heart of God. Then the next R is request. Ask God for help. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for what you need. And then listen. Be open to God's answers. The next R is resolve. Now remember, 
This is like 500 years old. This is tried and true. This is not Jeff coming up with some fancy little technique. This is a mystic who received this revelation from God and has helped millions and millions and millions of people over 500 years. The next R is resolve. Decide that you want to live your life according to Christ and his kingdom. And this is a place where you re-surrender. You name the places where you're overwhelmed. You name the places where you're powerless. And I'm going to put another prayer on the website, the John Wesley Covenant Prayer. I pray it every day, several times a day. I'm no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me be exalted for thee or brought low for thee. I heartily and freely yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, o glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth may be ratified in heaven. I do that as an act of resolution. I'm resolving to serve Christ and his kingdom. And the last R, you remember your identity. You remember who you are. You're a child of the living God. You're one in whom Christ dwells and delights. You remember who you are. You hear the book ends. You begin by resting in God's presence and God's love. And you end by remembering who you are as a child of the living God in whom Christ dwells and delights. This exercise is really important if you want to grow. As I close this sermon, a pastor friend of mine, he was visiting South Carolina with his family. They were driving along one of the popular highways there and there was this big sign, you pick peaches. And so what did he do? He decided to stop. And you know how that is. You get a bushel basket and you start to pick peaches. And then you pay the bill. So he started off into the orchard with his family and there was an old fellow who in his words as wrinkled as a peach pit who was tending the place said if you want the best fruit go deeper into the orchard. So he did. In a little while he heard this voice go deeper. So he did. After a little while, go deeper. And he did. After a little while, go deeper. And he did. After a little while, go deeper still. And he did. And my pastor friend, William Boggs, says he found the finest, plumpest peaches were deep in the orchard, untouched, and just waiting to be picked. Advent, my sisters and brothers, invites us to look at our lives and ask the question, have I gone deep enough? If you want to know how to survive the wilderness, if you want to know how to thrive in the desert, you got to go deep. And that's what John the Baptist was doing, albeit in his own weird way. He was the voice. Go deep. Go deeper. Go on. Go deeper. Go deeper still. And if you and I are willing to go deeper, sooner or later, we will experience what you see on the screen. And if you had to label what you are seeing I would label it hope. Bishop Yvette Flunder says, as those who claim the good news of Jesus, we are obligated to hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is an assurance that God is constant when nothing else is. And you and I can experience that in the wilderness of our lives. 
If only we are willing to go deep. Go deeper still. May it be so. Amen. In response to the reading and proclamation of God's word, I want to invite you to get your communion elements ready so that we might participate together. We're going to join in the prayer called the Great Thanksgiving. Would you join me, please, as we pray and as we give thanks? The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name as we join their unending hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered in many places and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast at his heavenly banquet. And Lord God, as we gather at this your holy table, we pray for those who are ill and in need of your healing grace. We pray for Jeff Hoig and his family, for Colton Hurt and his family, for Gary Farney and his family. And now I invite you to name in silence those for whom you would pray today. We surrender these, your people, to you, O God, trusting that you are at work by the power of your Holy Spirit. For we offer our prayer through your Son, Jesus Christ, 
with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Together now, let us pray the prayer that our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for we the people of God. Take and eat, take and drink, and be thankful. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thank you for joining us today for worship. We pray that our service has been a blessing to you in a multitude of ways. So go forth into this new week and may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon us and be at work in us in ways that would surprise us, in ways that would remind us that our lives are always in the palms of His hands. Amen and amen. your back and the sun on your face with a song in your heart and the promise of grace go in peace and in truth and let love lead your way go